Got 100 steps to go. Tonight I'll make it 99. By Ray Ray, 118. Chapter 23. A few days later, the large group gathered at McGonagall Castle and took the international port keys created by Sirius. They landed in Greece a short while later, marvelling at the deep blue-green ocean that surrounded them and the crisp white beach. Charlie's own port key from Romania, sent along with his wedding invitation, deposited him on the beach at nearly the same time. Sirius led them into the large mansion that was the only structure on the small island. There was flu access in the mansion, but the island itself had no other inhabitants. The nearest magical community was in Athens, and the house elves took care of making sure the kitchen was stocked. Sirius gave everyone a quick tour, and they all disappeared into their bedrooms to change, before spending the rest of the day on the beach. The major news at dinner that evening came from the most recently married couple, Tonks found herself under scrutiny when she refused the glass of wine offered to her. Blushing furiously, she and Rima shared their happy news. They were going to become parents! Everyone was ecstatic, congratulating them loudly, and Sirius had quickly had the house elves bring up some champagne to toast. Tonks got her very own glass of sparkling cider, and the evening turned into a festive party. Tonks found Ginny and Harry later, and apologised for taking some of their spotlight. Harry just shook his head. Don't worry about it, Tonks. We're really happy for you. Tonks beamed and gave both of them a hug before she headed up to bed with Remus. The group spent several days enjoying the sand and surf, and exploring the foreign magical community. Athens' version of Diagon Alley was much more of an open marketplace, with stalls set up that sold everything from cauldrons to fresh produce. Snape eagerly bought several potions ingredients that couldn't be found in Britain, while Hermione had to be pulled away from the bookseller, where she disappeared to in a large tome of history of the magical Greece. The morning of the wedding dawned bright and hot, and everyone was up early getting ready. The girls congregated in Ginny's room to prepare, while the boys went to Harry's. Molly had insisted that the two sleep in separate rooms the night before. She knew they were already married but she wanted them to uphold some of the traditions, such as not seeing each other before the ceremony. By late afternoon, the group began to gather in anticipation of the ceremony. The house elves had set up the simple altar on a stretch of beach just beyond the mansion. It was covered in flowers, lilies and orchids, as well as some light grey tool that fluttered in the sea breeze. The dark green vines that wound up the four posts of the altar the white chairs were all facing the altar and the ocean. They had timed the ceremony perfectly, so that it would take place at sunset. Grey tulle was affixed to each chair lining the aisle, a small bouquet of seagrass and white roses attached to each chair. The boardwalk was set up down the aisle and under the altar. This had been added so that Ginny's dress wouldn't get too covered in sand and allow her to walk easily in her heels. Her wedding dress wasn't exactly beach appropriate, but it meant so much to both of Harry and Ginny that she was wearing Lily's dress, so they added the harder surface to make it easier. Sharptooth was the last guest to arrive. He had been surprised to receive an invitation, and had accepted it willingly. Harry had given him a port key that would take him to the island before the ceremony, and return him to England whenever he wished to depart. The goblin took a seat next to Bill and Fleur, who greeted him with respectful nods. When the guests were all seated, invisible music began to play, and Harry took his spot at the altar with Amelia, who was officiating, and Ron. Both men were dressed simply and elegantly in formal suits. Their cummerbunds were soft sea green, charmed to specifically match the colour of the bridesmaids' dresses. Ron's boutonniere was white, to denote him as best man, while Harry's was a slightly more complex, made up of a white rose with dark green leaves, and a few sprigs of smaller flowers that had been charmed sea green. The boutonniere was tied up with a dark grey sheer ribbon. As the music played, Luna and Lays walked down the aisle first, followed by Susan and Neville, then Daphne and Bill. All three girls were wearing flowing chiffon dresses in a sea green colour, perfect for a beach wedding. The dresses were strapless with a sweetheart neckline, 
They were tight on top with a crisscrossing ruching before flowing out past the waist and coming to an abrupt cutoff at the knee. There was a dark grey satin sash tied around their waists. The men were wearing suits that matched bronze, with the only difference being their boutonnieres. While Ron's was white, the rest of the groomsmen were wearing roses that had been charmed sea green to match the girls' dresses. Next down the aisle was Hermione. Her dress was the same, however her sash was white instead. All three girls held bouquets that matched Harry's boutonniere. They had white roses, with flowers shaped like lavender, only sea green in colour. The bouquets were tied with dark grey ribbon. When they were all at the end of the aisle, Hermione, Susan, Luna and Daphne on one side, and Neville, Blaze and Bill lined up next to Ron. The music swelled, and the guests stood up. A few moments later, Ginny came walking down the aisle, her parents on either side. Harry had to remind himself to breathe, watching his wife walk towards him. She was so beautiful, and she was all his. Ginny locked eyes with him and smirked mentally. Damn straight, she said smugly, and don't you ever forget it. Harry nodded slightly, his eyes amused and full of love. Never, he promised seriously. When they reached the altar, Molly tearfully lifted Ginny's veil and tucked her loose hair behind her ears. Ginny had chosen a half updo, and the veil was attached to a set of hair clips encrusted with emeralds and diamonds, an heirloom that Ginny had chosen from the pot of fault specifically for this occasion. The veil itself was short, cutting off at her lower back, and blew prettily in the wind. Molly and Arthur willingly passed Ginny to Harry, and the two stepped up to Amelia. Amelia smiled at the couple and began the ceremony. Friends and family, we are gathered here this evening to witness what I can confidently term true love. Everyone here has been lucky enough to witness the growth of this relationship, and we look forward to seeing what these two will accomplish together. Amelia smiled at the couple. Harry and Ginny have chosen to write their own vows. Harry? Harry took a deep breath focusing on Ginny's warm brown eyes, looking up at him happily. He smiled. Ginny, the first time I saw you, you were answering your mother's question on which platform Hogwarts Express left from. I was eleven. At twelve, I felt disappointed that I didn't get the chance to see you sorted into your house. At thirteen, I was worried about how deeply the Dementor on the train would affect you and wondering how likely Ron was to kill me if I tried to comfort you. There was a tittering of laughter, and Ron let out a soft snort. Harry shrugged good-naturedly. At fourteen, I finally figured out what it was I was feeling. He took a deep breath and grasped Ginny's hands with his. Ginny, you are the smartest, most willful, determined, best thing that has ever happened to me. When I was doubting myself, you slapped me upside the head and gave me a reality check. The guests laughed again. When I was sad, you were there. When I was happy, it was because of you. I wish I could just say I love you and leave it at that. But those three words just don't encompass everything I feel for you. Some things may be uncertain, but there's one thing I know for sure. You and me together, forever. Ginny beamed as Amelia turned to her. Ginny? Ginny took a moment to collect herself before she spoke. When I was four, my father told me the story of Harry Potter for the first time. I was so sad when I heard about the little boy who lost his parents. When I was six, my brother started teasing me about how the only bedtime story I ever wanted to hear was Harry Potter's story. The audience chuckled and Ginny turned bashful. That was when I started telling my dad that I was going to marry Harry Potter. When I was ten, my brothers told me about how they had just met THE Harry Potter. I was so excited and disappointed that I didn't get the chance to talk to you. At eleven, you saved me for the first time of many. At twelve, I watched you struggle to overcome your fears, and my hero worship began to turn into admiration and respect. At 
13. You finally figured out what I had known since I was six. And you kissed me. Everyone laughed and Harry shrugged apologetically. I can't promise you that the Chudley Cannons will finally win a game. Ron let out an annoyed grunt, but Ginny kept going. I can't promise you that Hermione will finally learn how to cook without setting the stove on fire. It was Hermione's turn to get upset as her friends laughed. There were lots of things Hermione could do, better than pretty much anyone else. But cooking was not one of them. Ginny smiled. But I can promise you this. You and me, together, forever. Amelia was both amused and touched by their vows, but quickly called attention back to her. Harry, place the ring on Ginny's finger and repeat after me. With this ring, I wed thee. Harry quickly turned to Ron and took Ginny's wedding ring from him. He repeated the vow and then it was Ginny's turn. Amelia had her speak the same words as she placed Harry's wedding ring onto his fourth finger of his left hand. When she finished, Amelia turned to the guests and smiled. Harry and Ginny have stood before you today, professing their love for the world to see. By the power vested in me, I now pronounce you husband and wife. You may kiss your bride. Needing no further prompting, Harry swiftly leaned forward and gave Ginny a soul-searing kiss as their friends and family clapped hard. Much sooner than they would have liked, Harry and Ginny pulled apart and headed back down the aisle, followed by Hermione and Ron, Neville and Susan, Blaze and Luna, and Daphne and Bill. The rest of the crowd followed them back to the mansion and around the back, where the house elves had set up a reception space in the large garden. It was beautiful, Harry had to admit, as everyone took their seats and food began to appear. There were several smaller tables, all circling a wooden dance floor. The tablecloths were a light grey, with sea green napkins. Each table had a dark grey runner, and a centrepiece made up of white roses and lit candles. A wooden wireless stood at one corner of the dance floor, decorated with white roses and grey tulle. Everyone had a wonderful time, eating the magnificent meal and dancing until they couldn't feel their feet anymore. Sharptooth did not stay. He offered his congratulations to Harry and Ginny before heading back to England. Harry wasn't too upset. He had invited the goblin because he respected and liked him. But goblins were not exactly social creatures. He was honoured that his manager had even come to the ceremony, bringing with him a rather expensive present, a 200-year-old bottle of fire whiskey. There were, of course, the mandatory toasts, and Sirius got quite a few laughs and blushes as he did his level best to embarrass Harry. Once he was done, Hermione stood up. She smiled at the couple, knowing that even without the bond, those two really had something special. Taking a deep breath, she glanced around the small crowd, watching her. I think it's pretty safe to say that my friendship with Harry and Ron didn't exactly get off to the best start. Bossy goody two-shoes sound about right, boys? She grinned at the nods Harry and Ron immediately responded with, while the rest of the guests laughed. Hermione shook her head slightly. I was a pushy know-it-all, and I had no friends. But then, something happened. She saw Minerva wince at the reminder, and shrugged. I've always said that Harry has a saving people thing, and it was pretty obvious right from the start. You see, that Halloween of our first year, a professor let a troll into the castle as a diversion, and it was just my bad luck that I happened to be right in its path. But Harry and Ron saved me. And from that point on, we were nearly inseparable. There are some things you just can't go through without becoming friends. And knocking out a 12-foot mountain troll is one of them. There were a few disbelieving looks, as some people learnt for the first time how the trio became a trio. Hermione paused to collect her thoughts. Ginny and I didn't exactly become friends right away. She admitted. It was a gradual thing, beginning around the end of my second year, her first. But once we started, it just took off. Ginny, you're an amazing friend. You've always been willing to listen, and you've always been up for a girl's night when I needed it. You know how easy it is to get girl talk out of those two. She jerked her hair to Harry and Ron to general amusement. So, to make a long story short, 
I've known Harry and Ginny apart, and I've known them together. I've seen their relationship grow and change. I've seen them go from awkward teenagers to a real couple. Even at 13 and 14 years old, they knew that they were different. What they had, what they have, is so much bigger than we could ever imagine. They fell into a relationship as easy as some of us would fall asleep. Harry found a new best friend, and I couldn't be happier. Harry looked a little guilty, but Hermione smiled softly at him, letting him know that she wasn't upset at all. With Harry and Ginny, it's as easy as breathing. I've never seen two people more right for each other. She picked up her champagne flute, and the rest of the guests followed suit. So, to Harry and Ginny. May you have enough happiness to make you sweet, enough trials to make you strong, enough sorrow to keep you human, enough success to keep you eager, and enough determination to make each day better than yesterday. Everyone clapped as they took a sip of their champagne, and Hermione sat down. Ron was next, and he stood up nervously. I'm not as good with words as Hermione, but I'll do my best. He pulled out a piece of paper and unfolded it. Glancing around at the guests, he shrugged. Hermione helped me find this. Everyone chuckled, and Ron grinned self-deprecatingly. He cleared his throat and began to recite the poem that he had copied from a book Hermione had loaned him. Love is friendship caught on fire. It is quiet mutual confidence, sharing and forgiving. It is loyalty through good and bad times. It settles for less than perfection and makes allowances for human weaknesses. Love is content with the present, hopes for the future, and does not brood over the past. It is in the day-in and day-out chronicles of irritations, problems, compromises, small disappointments, big victories, and working towards common goals. If you have love in your life, it can make up for a great many things you lack. If you do not have it, no matter what else there is, it is not enough. Ron coughed, his face turning pink with embarrassment as he folded up the paper and stuck it back in his pocket. I, well, Hermione and I, found that in a book, and I thought it was appropriate. Harry, you've been like my brother ever since that first train ride to Hogwarts, and now you really are my brother. Though, mate, I've got to say, you've always been a Weasley. Don't know why you felt you had to marry Jenny to get that. The guests laughed while Ginny glared and Harry rolled his eyes, amused. Ron sobered, turning serious as he focused on his sister and brother-in-law. I may be a bit thick at times. He pointedly ignored Ginny's arched eyebrow. Only at times? But even I knew that you two were in it for the long haul, even back then. I remember watching you together and telling people to be prepared to be surprised. Because you weren't going to follow any normal standards for a teenage relationship. I remember thinking that one of these days, you'd make the rest of us believe in true love. His blush deepened, and here we are, years later, and still growing strong. I have no doubt in my mind that I will be watching you act as sickeningly sweet and in love, 10, 20, 50 years down the line, as you are right now. Harry glanced over at Ginny his eyes softening as she looked back at him. He leaned down and gave her a quick peck on the lips. Ron rolled his eyes. Exactly. He picked up his champagne flute. So, to Harry and Ginny, the best brother and sister a guy could have. Can it you two? He glared at Fred and George. The twins put on mock expressions of hurt as they both closed their mouths, and a clear indication to the group that they had been planning on protesting Ron's statement. <laughs> Everyone laughed as they drank, and Ron sat down quickly. Ginny reached over and lightly coughed his shoulder. I don't know why you thought you'd be bad at that, she admonished. That was wonderful, Ron. Thank you. Ron blushed brightly, but smiled as thanks, as Hermione gave him a sideways hug, also conveying her pride at his words. Several more people stood to speak, including Neville, Susan, Remus, Minerva, and Molly and Arthur, each one conveyed their joy at being a part of Harry and Ginny's lives, and how happy they were that the two were together. 
finally Harry stood up. I think it's my turn now, yeah? Glanced back at Ginny and smiled. Well, I think I covered our relationship pretty well during the ceremony. But I'm sure I can come up with something else to talk about. Ginny rolled her eyes while the guests smiled and laughed. When you're 14 years old, you meet a girl, and everything seems so easy. You're young, you've got a crush, and you don't have to have everything figured out yet. He took a deep breath. Ginny and I never had that. Even at 14, I was already an adult. At 13, Ginny had already phased down evil in its base form and conquered it. Neither of us fell into the typical categories for a normal teenager. The two of us on our own? It's a wonder we came out as well adjusted as we were. Ginny snorted and Harry shrugged. But, you see, something happened when we got together. It was amazing, and entirely unprecedented. Ginny glanced at him sharply. While those who knew about the bond wondered where Harry was going with this. They hadn't thought he would tell anyone else. Harry beamed, his eyes not leaving Ginny's perfect face for a moment. I finally worked up the courage to let the girl of my dreams know how I felt. And, by some miracle, she felt the same. I won't ask why she chose me. I'll just be happy that she did. Ginny, you're my life, my heart, my soul. You make me happier than I ever thought I ever could be. And, if you let me, I'll spend the rest of my life trying to make you feel the same way. Ginny couldn't sit still anymore. She stood up and grasped Harry in a tight hug. You already do, she said, her mental voice thick as she struggled to hold back tears of joy. They held each other a moment longer, before Harry pulled back and cleared his throat. Ginny sat back down, blushing lightly. Anyway, Harry continued. Ginny, our road might not be the easiest. Our road might not have been the easiest. But through it all, you were a steady presence at my side. I have never doubted that we will spend the rest of our lives together. And I look forward to fully enjoying the journey. Ginny grinned happily as everyone drank their champagne. Harry set his flute down and gestured to the wireless. Obediently, it began to play once more. Now that's enough of talking. Let's get back to the party. He held out a hand for Ginny and pulled her onto the dance floor. Around them, other couples followed their lead, and soon enough the floor was packed. It was nearly dawn by the time everyone was headed off to bed. Much earlier than any of them would have liked, they were gathering back on the front steps of the mansion to take port keys back to England. Harry and Ginny came down to see them off, once more accepting congratulations, before the large group began to depart. Minerva was the last one to leave, waiting specifically for that moment, so that she could inform the couple of their new living arrangements. She smiled at the pair, truly happy for them. I have arranged your suite to be prepared for you near Gryffindor Tower, she informed them. Everything will be ready when you arrive. They thanked the headmistress before she left, and it was just the two of them. Harry grinned at Ginny. Swimming or bed? He asked mischievously. Ginny levelled a mock glare in his direction, and she untied the simple sundress she had been wearing. Underneath was a skimpy bikini that Ginny had picked out specifically. Without a backwards glance, she immediately ran off towards the crystal blue surf. Shaking his head fondly, Harry stripped off his shirt and followed her. The couple had a wonderful time on their own and neither one wanted to return to England on the morning of the first. They lay cuddled in bed late that morning, knowing that they needed to get up soon to catch the port key back, but neither one was willing to move just yet. Harry was absentmindedly running a hand down Ginny's side, making small patterns with his finger as Ginny hummed contentedly. This isn't the real honeymoon, you know, Harry informed her. Ginny forced her eyes open and looked at him, confused. What do you mean? Harry shrugged lightly with one shoulder, his wandering hand not pausing in its movements. This is just a couple of days of relaxation. I'm thinking about a longer trip over Christmas. How does Australia sound? Or we could go to Italy. Ginny was now staring. Oh, 
Or we could go to Italy? Her voice was mostly sarcastic. Harry grinned. I've been spending a good deal of time looking over the Potter family holdings. When I went over things with Sharptooth several years ago, he informed me of three properties. But that was just because those were the only ones available to me at the time. Now that I've officially taken over as head of house, I have access to all of them. We have a villa in Tuscany, as well as a manor on the coast near Perth. The villa has been rented out before, but it has been vacant for the last couple of years. Ginny considered what he was telling her. She had been stunned by the idea that he owned a castle and a manor in Britain. But apparently that was just the tip of the iceberg. Any other properties you've forgotten to mention? She said archly. Harry shrugged. There's a penthouse in New York, but that one's being rented out for nearly ten years now. We've also got a little cottage in southern France that my great-great-grandparents retired to. No one's lived there since, so I'm not sure what state it's in. And then there's a flat in Barcelona, and... Ginny reached out and covered his mouth with one hand, even though he was speaking through their minds and not out loud. Amusingly, she shook her head. We'll go over all the Potter holdings later. I'd like to go to Tuscany, she decided. We've got the rest of our lives to visit all of these places. Harry nodded contentedly. Yes, we do, he agreed. Knowing that they really had to get up now, the couple left the comfortable bed and began to get dressed. Soon enough, their bags were packed and shrunken in their pockets, and they were each holding the port key with one hand. Their bags contained everything they would need for the school year as well, since they would be going directly to the station from there. They gave their gorgeous surroundings one last look, before they left the white sandy beach and reappeared a short time later on the platform in the wizarding travel section of King's Cross. Nearby, the flues were hard at work, but they didn't stay. They were going to meet everyone on the platform, so they didn't waste any time in leaving the room and walking a short distance to the barrier between platforms 9 and 10. Harry looked down a few inches into Ginny's loving gaze. What's the platform number again? He murmured teasingly, remembering his first trip here. Ginny grinned. Platform nine and three quarters. Please, can't I go? Harry chuckled, taking her hand and leading her through the barrier. The scarlet engine shone brightly in front of them, but they didn't spend too much time looking at it, instead focusing their search on finding their group that was waiting for them. The Weasleys were there with Hermione, as were Luna and her father, and the Greengrasses. The others were not coming, since they didn't actually have family heading back to school. They had, however, all promised to meet in Hogsmeade on the first weekend the students were allowed to visit the village. Ginny knew that this group would not let their friendship slide. They would be as close as siblings forever, and she couldn't be happier about that. There were hugs given all around before the warning whistle sounded, and Luna and Astoria got on the train. Ginny turned back to Harry and gave him a tight hug. I'll miss you, she whispered softly. Harry chuckled. I'm going to see you in a few hours, he reminded her. Ginny shrugged as she pulled back. I'll still miss you, she said stubbornly. Harry nodded understandingly. Me too, he replied. A cough drew their attention away from each other, and Molly smiled gently. Ginny, dear, you need to get on the train. Ginny nodded and gave Harry and her mother one last hug, before she hurried towards the train, which was starting to move away from the platform. Harry helped her get on, and she turned around, waving to the group of Weasleys that had crowded around her husband. When the train had left King's Cross behind, she went to find Luna, who was sitting with Astoria in a compartment nearby. This is so strange, she commented with a sigh already missing Harry. She felt her husband's amusement in her head as he responded to that thought. You know we're never really apart, he said soothingly. I'm always here, and can't wait until this evening when we see each other again. I'll see you at the feast. Ginny let out another sigh, and forced herself to focus on Luna and Astoria to pass the time. It was amazing how much things had changed over the years. She had gone from a naive girl with a schoolhood crush to a woman with a soul bond. She and Harry had been through so much together. Dark Lords, 
the loss of loved ones, manipulative headmasters, horrible relatives, death eaters bent on causing as much destruction as possible. But through it all, they had had each other, and that had made everything seem better, even when it wasn't. Harry had always been such a strong presence in her life, and no matter what happened, tomorrow, next week, next month, or ten years down the line, she knew she would face it all with him at her side, the way it should be. She felt Harry smile in the back of her mind, and don't you ever forget it. End of chapter. Hi guys, hope you enjoyed this. Okay, so the next one is the epilogue and the end of this series. And can we just talk about how beautiful that wedding was? I loved that. Ron's lovely bit with him saying that Harry was always his brother. I mean, I know they've said that before, but because it's the wedding, it's just extra special. I love that. I love the banter between him and Ginny talking about how many properties they now own. So funny. And anyway, just, yes, it's beautiful. And you guys know the drill. Like, comment and subscribe and hit that bell to get notified for whenever I upload a new video. Have a good day, night or whatever time zone you're in. Bye my guys, gals and non-binary pals. I'll see you in another video. Take care.